Hi everybody, welcome to Talk Gnosis. In this episode, we talk to Clark Aitkins about the Gospel of Mary. This is part one. We're going to talk about the brief summary of the Gospel of Mary. We're going to talk about the role of Mary as a teacher in this and other documents. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, soul ascent that happens in this document. And more interestingly, we're going to talk about how Grant Morrison's The Invisibles has to do with the Gospel of Mary and Clark's experience of it. So stick around. You're not going to want to miss it coming up on Talk Gnosis. So let's get right into it. What is the Gospel of Mary? Can you give us a brief overview of it? Well, um, the Gospel of Mary is uh, popularly accepted as being an, uh, a Gnostic text. Um, it, um, it's not technically, I mean, it has been argued it's not technically a Gospel since it doesn't specifically focus on Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. um, but a character who is usually acknowledged as being Jesus is one of the main characters, is the Savior. Jesus is never named in the text. Um, and the other main character, of course, is Mary, and we are not really certain, of course, completely certain if that's Mary Magdalene or not, but it's generally assumed it is Mary Magdalene, um, though some scholars will argue that it's another Mary. And the history of the text, roughly, probably written about uh, somewhere in the second century, if I remember correctly, um, we have two Greek fragments, and the larger piece that we have is uh, um, uh, written in Sahidic Coptic, and came out of the Nag Hammadi Library in the same folio that we got the Apocryphon of John out of and mm -hmm. a few other interesting bits. All right. What happens in the Gospel of Mary? Well, mostly what happens in the Gospel of Mary is, is, is a lot of instruction. Um, and so for me to apply a sort of modern genre concept to it, I kind of see it as an instruction booklet uh, for a spiritual path. The first half of what we do have because we are missing about half of it, mm -hmm. is uh, the Savior explaining the nature of matter um, and giving some instruction on what I would say is basic introduction to the spiritual path that's introduced in the book. The second half of the book is, of course, everybody's favorite, the soul ascent yeah. and all the great uh, archons. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, uh, the third part is Jesus and Mary get married and they have a secret child <laughs> who gives birth to the Merovingian kings and that's suppressed by right. the Catholic Church and by a horde of albino monks. Right? Well, yes, and uh, disappointingly enough, now Harvard has decided to join in on suppressing this secret story. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, Brother Clark, the, um, what, what is kind of the, the role that, that Mary has in, in this? Um, is, it, is it kind of different than what we see in the, in the canonical books? And isn't there even like uh, at some point in the, in the, in the, the text, so the, don't they be like, be quiet? Don't, you don't know what you're talking about? You're just a silly woman? Is, that, is she given a, you know, that, a more prominent role than perhaps we see her in, in, other, uh, in other traditions and other texts? She's given a more prominent role in that it goes into more detail about what she's instructing the other disciples on. Um, but even in the uh, canonical text, uh, Mary Magdalene is still an instructor. She's the first one in John that, you know, that explains to the disciples that Jesus has returned. Um, and so this is actually a very old Christian tradition that Mary Magdalene plays that role. Um, we do also see another, another pattern in the story where of tension between Mary Magdalene um, and Peter. Um, as in this tension we see repeated in the Pista Sophia and one or two other texts. And this has become a little bit of a, a theme that we see in some of these early Christian texts. Um, but she goes into far more detail and she of course comes out on top and uh, uh, with the detail and the intimate detail that she has of the, of the spiritual teachings that the Savior passes on. Mm -hmm. So she is... Um she is a teacher in this text, as she is in other Gnostic texts. Yeah, and, yeah. and I, I mean, kind of part of the point of this text is that she's the teacher who's picking up where the Savior leaves off. Yeah. And in, you know, in some scenes, if you visualize it in your mind, it's very interesting. Um, the Savior leaves, and then Mary stands up, almost as if to physically take his place. Sure. Yeah. She, in some ways, she's almost, I mean, you can make the argument for, for John as well, uh, that, that she's the apostle to the apostles. Right, like a John, she's yes. the first one to announce the resurrection, and in this text, she's the Savior gives her instruction, and then she passes on the instruction to the apostles. Correct? They perhaps you could extrapolate that they're not having the same instruction and the same experiences that she is. Um, so 
Sorry, I lost part of your question there. Can you, can you go back on that? We'll have to edit this in post. Nah, that's all right. Nah. Um, she's, uh, she's kind of the apostle to the apostles, which you could even kind of extrapolate right. from the canonical John. And she's, she's kind of having perhaps these experiences, maybe this vision of Christ. She's getting this instruction of, sorry, the Savior. And mm -hmm. she's actually giving it to the other apostles. Is that correct? Well, like, um... Uh, party to it in the same way she is. A large part of that, I say, is, is correct. Uh, of course, she's not called the Apostle of the Apostles until much later, um, right. but the, the tradition that that's, that title is flowing from, can, I mean, we can see this sort of process going on here. Mm -hmm. um, so the problem with the text, of course, is the two rather large lacunae, which yeah. are, you know, entire pages that are missing. Um, and one of the lacunae ends with uh, uh, Mary beginning to give some instruction that Jesus had passed on to her about how one sees visions. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're gone by about four or six pages, I forget how many. And then um, it tears right into uh, Mary, uh, Mary explaining the soul ascent. It's a bit of an assumption that that soul ascent instruction is coming from the Savior. It's a probably a very safe assumption, but it's not explicitly stated in the text as we have it right now. Yeah. Uh, I want to get into more of the Soul Ascent stuff in the podcast, but can you just briefly um, d detail what did the Soul Ascent look like in this uh, in this text? Um, we're not really sure if it's a post-mortem or pre-mortem Soul Ascent. We had both of them in the ancient world, but yeah. as the soul, as this generic human soul, ascends through the spheres, assumedly spheres, um, there are four archons, or well, powers, mm -hmm. technically not archons in this text, um, that the soul has to talk its way through. It has to have a conversation with them and convince it or somehow trick it that it gets, so that it can get passed yeah. into the next realm. And those four realms are darkness, desire, ignorance, and wrath. Mm. Yeah, and that, that theme pops up a lot in not, not only other Gnostic texts, but in a lot of different uh, spiritual traditions of the ancient world. So it's, it's ancient by the time we get to, uh, yeah. to uh, the Gospel of Mary, for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, very interesting that the, um, that the Gnostics are picking up on this, and especially um, in, a, in a climate of early Christianity where that, that doesn't make it to what becomes Orthodox Christianity. And, and um, we've had a number of guests on the show lately who have been talking about kind of the, f the idea that Gnostics, that Gnosticism as a category is more or less useful in describing a kind of Christianity instead of mm -hmm. something that's separate. And I, I think that's an interesting way that scholarship is going, that to see these as Christian traditions. Um, oh yeah, right. Instead of something else that has appropriated Christianity. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a Christian tradition that has, well, so taken, if we're going to talk about it in terms of the soul ascent, this is a form of Christianity represented in this text that has appropriated or taken on something that everybody was already doing anyway. Yeah. Everybody already had a form of soul ascent. This mm -hmm. was nothing new or mysterious. It is to us in our modern or postmodern minds. This is, all sounds very weird, but back then everybody had that. Just like back then everybody had a form of astrology. It was in the air. Everybody knew right. about it. Yeah. And we'll get into it more in, in the podcast, but the, uh, as you said, both appropriation, but, but dialogue, right? This is, um, these forms of Christianity, any form of Christianity, any form of any religion or human community and intellectual thought is going to be in dialogue with what's around it. Sometimes it's repudiating it, sometimes it's borrowing it, sometimes it's arguing with it and against it. So particularly these, these early Gnostic Christians seemed very extra keen on grappling with the philosophy, the religious ideas, the magical ideas, the meditative ideas, the contemplative ideas that are in all the different traditions surrounding them. Um, w would you say that's accurate, that they're, you know, that they see the soul ascent in perhaps these other traditions, maybe in other forms of Christianity, and they're engaging with them, adapting them into these texts? Sometimes there's a, a bit of a meta-textual thing going on where they're like, maybe they're thinking of a specific movement or um, a teacher or um, a teaching that perhaps is, is not what we would call Christianity today and, you know, maybe what we would call Greek philosophical and pagan? Um, well, yeah, of course. So everybody's in constant conversation within their community and the communities are in constant conversation with each other. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, this sort of syncretism is going to happen. It's a naturally occurring thing. Um, and people naturally do this all the time. Um, there would be really no way for this tradition to have developed 
in any sort of pure form without taking on the local traditions, without absorbing them or becoming a part of them mm -hmm. to differing degrees. And um, that would have been different. I would say that that would have been different um, from region to region. I mean, from Boston yeah. to Connecticut, you would have been <laughs> right. you would have seen two completely different forms of Christianity split, uh, split across up. the street. Even. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So that's a pretty natural thing to have happen. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, the gospel uh, talks a little bit about um, the death and resurrection of the Savior. What uh, what specifically does it say about that? The Gospel of Mary. Yeah. Well, it doesn't really. Well, it doesn't really have anything to say yeah. about the the the, the re death and resurrection of the Savior. It seems to be in response to some things that other Christians were saying about the death and resurrection mm. of the Savior. And um, as we were saying before, uh, before we started recording, the interesting thing is talking about Paul um, and different forms of Pauline Christianity that may or may you know may have been around at the time. Um, Paul, of course, one of his big contributions to Christian thought is that the, the death and resurrection of Jesus in and of itself is salvific and yeah. does the process. Um, and this book is responding with, no, it's not the death and resurrection of Jesus, it's the example of Jesus, it's mm -hmm. the teaching of Jesus, and that his death is not as central. Sure. So this is part of the larger conversation that's going on within Christianity, yeah, mm -hmm. or seems to be. Right, and would be continue to be hashed out for the next several hundred years over yeah. the, the course of several councils and everything, too. Oh, yeah, 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 and even today, I mean, mm -hmm. even... I mean, I met several people who would agree that this discussion is still going on. Mm -hmm. yeah. What does the Gospel of Mary have to do with Grant Morrison's The Invisibles? Oh. <laughs> I think that's a good way to start the podcast. Okay, let's talk about that yeah. for a bit. So, um, <clears throat> the whole point of the Gospel of Mary for me, I think at this point, is the idea that it can be used as an instruction booklet for spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. um, and so I come from a couple of years of uh, esoteric background. Um, and The Invisibles was a series that came to me as it uh, was beginning to come out in mm -hmm. the mid and late 90s um, and was really important to me at the time when I was feeling a little bit spiritually confused um, and got involved in some Western esotericism myself, um, including some, um, I don't know, weird uh, chaos magic type stuff. Um, and Morrison was into that. So this, all of this appealed, this, all of this came together in this perfect storm in my little world. Mm -hmm. um, and so that book is, that series of books has been with me ever since. And um, I study it occasionally. Sometimes it's like a touchstone to keep me yeah. feeling okay about myself. So it's become a bit of a sacred text in and of itself just for me on a personal level. Sure. So, of course, like any other comic book series, you have your sort of origin stories. Mm -hmm. These are the things that you kind of have to have. They're almost required. So, um, over one of, and over again. Yeah, over and over again. And one of the origin stories um, that always appealed to me the strongest um, was uh, a character named Lord Fanny, mm -hmm. who is a Brazilian uh, transvestite shaman. And her initiation story uh, was just very appealing because she was very poor in Brazil and had to um, go through the sort of alchemical process of turning shit into gold. Mm -hmm. um, she had to do something with her horrible, painful life um, of being a street prostitute in Brazil. I can't imagine yeah. how horrible that must have been. So, I mean, this is this story has always st struck me as like being one of the strongest characters I've ever read about in any fiction. Mm. So. When I started going into detail with the Gospel of Mary and started noticing this interaction with the Archons, and this is also one of the reasons I came to Gnosticism years later anyway, is this concept of the soul ascent and working through the Archons um, and, and learning how to interact with them. But the Gospel of Mary is very specific about working through darkness and ignorance and desire and wrath. Mm -hmm. All of these things that these characters had to work through in the invisibles, things that I have to work through in my personal life. So this connection is uh, pretty strong on a very emotional, intimate level for me. Um, so that's what it has to do with it, is that I see her character as being reminiscent or uh, a sort of repeating pattern um, in uh, the Gospel of Mary, in the story that, that Mary Magdalene teaches to the disciples, where she teaches them, you have to go through the darkness of the world. Mm -hmm. the camp, don't embrace the pain of the world. Don't embrace the suffering as Paul has you do. Go through it. Work your way through it. Turn yourself into something more. Mm -hmm. the, the, the kind of fundamental optimism I find in Gnosticism that I think a lot of its detractors don't see. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like, 
we get accused of being world-hating dualists, and they, you know, when you look at it in a certain way, that's true. Right? Yeah. Um, but I think that the the dualism that is present in Gnosticism points towards a a, a higher unity. If that's if uh, I'm going off on a bit of a tangent here, but we can do that. It's the podcast. That's what the podcast is for. <laughs> yeah. So the the idea that you have a you have this this ascent, whether it's a literal like visionary ascent journey that you take, uh, you know, in a, a trance state or whatever mm -hmm. visionary uh, experience, whether it's something that happens after your, to your soul after you die, or whether it's a metaphor, right, for right. the processes that you're talking about. Yeah. You know, well, sorry, sorry to interrupt, Father. Or it's all three of those. Things. <laughs> or, or yeah, both. Yes, and, right. right. That's yes, yeah. yes. So, um, just the idea that this is a uh, a, a tradition that gets that gets passed along and uh, reappears over and over and over again mm -hmm. um, in various, you know, like you mentioned, the Egyptians and the Greeks earlier and, and the, the Roman uh, pagan religions and, and, and all of these things, Mithraism and, you know, any number of these traditions where this ascent journey happens. Mm -hmm. um, and I've, I've just completely lost my train of thought <laughs> from where I started, but I, f I think I said some profound things in there that we'll probably cut out later. From, right, yeah. and, the, and the profound things that I caught before I phased out was, um, <laughs> uh, one of the things you're talking about is the accusation of, you know, oh, world-hating yeah, world -hating dualism. dualism. Yeah. And, and a lot of people really focus on that. And I think the reason they focus on that is because when you read, if you can make yourself force yourself to sit down and read one of these weird texts from yeah. beginning to end right. all the way through. Like say, we'll take for example the Apocryphon of John, which sure. gets very strange, mm -hmm. long lists of names and s weird things about body parts. Mm -hmm. um, you really get caught up in the details of right. this dualistic world, the right. material versus spiritual world that's going on in this in, in this well, text. yeah, right. That's the story, yeah. But that's not the story. That's well, a part of the story, yeah. but it's the largest part of the story in terms of t the reader's time. Yes. Yeah. So the reader sees nothing but this dualism going on and doesn't necessar necessarily put it into the context of the pleroma at the beginning yeah. and the pleroma at the end. Yes. Right. Yeah. And so and so they miss this concept that this is they're focusing they're getting the background and the foreground mixed up, mm -hmm. which is I think I think that ev happens in everybody's personal lives, and yeah. and part of the thing with the Gospel of Mary is that she teaches you very specifically. I say, yeah, you know, you if you get caught up in the darkness of that dualism, you have to just go through it. Mm -hmm. You can't run away from it. You can't deny it. Right. You have to go through the hard process of remembering things. Yeah, even if this world is less real than the pleroma, right? To use that yeah, how language, you, yeah, yeah. it's still the tools that you have to the 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 tools of the world are what you have to transcend it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and and I think that also kind of points to just what Clark was saying, in in that these uh, it's not either or, right? Because it's it's written as sort of a visionary ascent, a literal. Not, I don't know how anything is literal when it's outside of the body and you're <laughs> dealing with archons and rulers, but you know what I mean. Yeah. A a literal ascent through uh, these powers of of darkness. Uh, and um, negativity, but you know they they are like uh, sorry. What were the four rulers again? Uh, 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 Clark, like these are things that are obviously that we encounter in our day to day lives and encounter in our soul. So right. this is not just a visionary ascent. This is, as you've mentioned, an instruction manual for how we should live our lives and perhaps deal with what's inside of us as well as outside of us. In my right in my opinion, as well as the instructions of the visionary ascent. So I, I really do, and I hope I'm not reading in a modern perspective to the text, but, you know, it's neither a psychological reading nor a literal reading, but, of course, both at the same time. Right. And, uh, and sorry again, what, what are those four powers that you must, you must, um, you must uh, get through? A darkness, desire, ignorance, and wrath. And wrath is broke up into a subset of archons or subset of powers, subpowers, I don't know what you call them. Mm -hmm. um, most of them having to do with wrath and the ignorance of the world and the wisdom of the world and all the rest of that sort of thing, yeah. Do you think right. there's a specific reason why it happens in that order? <laughs> you know, I've given that some thought and so just today I was wondering about this and, and um, reminding myself what I had written before I came up here. Mm -hmm. And um, honestly, Okay, so bear with me here. Sure. So uh, I'm going to get a little wackadoodle so yeah. we can hash this, this out and you guys can correct me. And just <laughs> so That's fine. This is what 
this is what the podcast portion is for. Good. So well, it, then yeah. you guys can help me figure this out. See, here's this thing. Again, if you're reading and writing, things happen in a, in a linearly. Mm -hmm. So you have to go through one characterization or personification of these things at a time. But right. really, it's all one big system. Mm -hmm. So it's darkness and ignorance and desire and wrath, they're all part of the same thing. It might not necessarily matter what order you go through them in. Mm -hmm. It seems to matter the order that you enact the process taught by the Savior to deal with these issues. But the lessons that they come at you and the order that you deal with them and... That I'm not really convinced that that's super important. Now, of course, if, now if we're using a, a system of soul ascent that was based on like a more classical system that was astrological and based on going through the powers mm -hmm. of, the, of the planets, then I would say, I would argue that order was probably far more important. Sure. But I think these are all aspects of the same thing. It's like a giant four or seven or 11 headed beast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Yeah. At least that's and, the uh, idea I was playing with today. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, that's it for part one. I hope you enjoyed it. Next time, in part two, we're going to be talking about the Gospel of Mary as an instruction manual and kind of what it told people to do. Uh, we're going to talk about feminism in the Gospel of Mary and can you read feminism back into uh, this document. And uh, we're going to also talk about practical soul ascent, kind of what the soul ascent looks like, its relationship to Jewish mystical traditions like Merkaba and Kabbalah, and uh, also some Greek mystery traditions traditions and things like that. It's going to be a very interesting episode, so you're going to want to either subscribe to us on YouTube or subscribe to the podcast at GnosticWisdom.net if you haven't done so already to catch all of that. And if you found this uh, content valuable and interesting, please do give us uh, some support on Patreon.com slash Gnostic, and uh, every little bit that you pledge helps us to grow the network and do more and interesting shows. So stick around, because part two is coming up next week. And uh, we will continue this very interesting conversation with Clark Aitken. See you next week.